Good morning. And welcome and welcome to the second uh, guest lecture on comparative constitutional law. It is uh, our pleasure today to have here uh, Karl Kessler, who is uh, a senior researcher at the Institute for Comparative uh, Federalism at the uh, European Academy of Bolzano Bozen. Uh, this institute, this uh, uh, center, is uh, one of the centers in which uh, advanced the research on the topic of federalism, regionalism, uh, local autonomy is carried out, uh, is uh, really uh, an important place uh, in the European and global uh, uh, scenario where research on these topics are conducted. And uh, uh, so we are privileged in having Carl here for also another reason, uh, because he is co-author of, of a very important book. This book, which is uh, entitled Comparative Federalism, Constitutional Arrangements and Case Law. Uh, it is uh, the book from which uh, we have taken uh, one of the chapters assigned uh, in your reading list. And it is a very recent book, uh, co-authored by uh, Karl Kessler and uh, Francesco Palermo, is going to be another guest in our series. It is an important book because uh, it provides uh, a fresh uh, account for federalism from a comparative perspective. And therefore is going to be uh, probably an, a very important instrument for those who, of you who would like to pursue more in-depth research in this uh, uh, field. Um, so far in our uh, examination of federalism, we have just outlined the main topics. We have given the basic definitions of federalism, of uh, a federal state or a confederation. And these are the building block from which uh, Karl Kessler will develop his uh, lecture today. Uh, his lecture is uh, entitled The Trajectory of Mature Federal Systems, which uh, in my view when we planned uh, this topic at least uh, is uh, uh, Focused is a topic focused on two elements. First of all, the trajectory, which implies an element of dynamic. Federal systems are to be studied as uh, entities, as uh, uh, arrangements that have uh, a life of their own. They evolve in the light of uh, the circumstances of politics, of history, of uh, economics. And therefore, they are uh, to be studied as uh, entities that are resilient. And uh, we are going to see also which are the variables that prompt evolution and change in uh, uh, federal arrangements. The other element of the title, which is important to consider, is uh, the mature adjective. Uh, Karl Kessler is going to explain us what are to be considered federal mature systems. And uh, in particular, I think he's going to focus on the three constitutional systems, the United States, Germany, and Canada, which are among uh, the most uh, uh, investigated and, and explored uh, legal systems, federal arrangements, uh, from which um, theories and accounts of federalism are usually developed. This can be an advantage, but there is also a risk in uh, focusing too much on uh, um, these topics. And this is also something that will uh, uh, probably uh, trigger some consideration also from a methodological perspective. Without uh, much 
ado, I will leave the floor to Karl Kessler, and uh, as usual, we will have uh, uh, a lecture structured in two parts. The first one will uh, approximately end uh, at uh, 12. We'll have a 10 minutes break, and then we'll complete in the second hour. Please, Karl. Uh, well, thank you, Marco. Is that switched on now, or can you hear me? Yeah? yeah? Okay, great. Um, thanks for the invitation, Marco, and thanks for having me here. It's always a huge pleasure to be here at the University of Trento. I always uh, remember here very uh, interested students and very active students, and thus I also encourage you to uh, intervene, to ask questions, uh, come to ask co to, to private, private comments. Uh, just interrupt me at any time, so no problem with that. Just raise your hand and uh, uh, stop me if something is not uh, clear. Um, so, Marco, already, um, uh, you already made the perfect introduction into the title. Uh, I have an additional slide here because actually you were the inventor of this uh, nice title, the trajectory of uh, mature federal systems. And this is a, a term that actually comes from physics, of course. So let's uh, have a bit of physics to start with. I hope that you are not specialists in physics because I'm not, so I hope not to make huge mistakes here. But just, just what is important here, uh, a trajectory um, implies two things. There has to be an origin, there has to be a be begin point. So if we apply that to a federal constitution, then this is, of course, the founding of the constitution. And there is um, um, a movement maybe even an end point. There are federal systems which uh, have vanished in history, so not all federal systems uh, have uh, survived until today. So uh, what we will do now is to look uh, at these three examples uh, that uh, Professor Rani already mentioned before, at the origins of these systems and also at the evolution of these systems over time and what are the drivers of this uh, evolution. Uh, but first, uh, a bit of a um, um, repetition maybe, but something to fresh up um, um, from, from a lecture that uh, Professor Dani has given you already. Um, so the origins of federal systems, so why do we have um, federal systems? What are the rationales, uh, the reasonings behind having federal systems? I guess you uh, touched upon that issue uh, already in a previous uh, lecture. Any ideas? So if you look for example, um, at the first two rationali that uh, often have led to the creation of federal systems, and not only of federal, uh, federal states per se, but also confederations. I guess you al al already, already touched upon the differentiation between confederations and federations as well. Uh, m m many of them have had a, a rationale that had a lot to do with security or and or with economic reasons. If you look, for example, um, to the example of Switzerland. So much of the, the integration of Switzerland, first in a, in, a, in a confederation and then in 1848 into a federation, you know, into a fully fledged federation, had to do, of course, with uh, the threat from an external force, the Habsburg Empire. So there was a security rationale behind that. Not only, of course, there are other factors uh, behind it as well. And in the case of Canada, you all also had um, uh, a security rationale, which in part also um, uh, favored then the creation of uh, the Canadian Federation in 1867. Um, if you think uh, that's not a coincidence that Canada was um, uh, made a, fund a federation in 1867 because what um, had uh, happened uh, to the south of Canada two years earlier, what, what, what happened, had happened there from 1861 until 1865. There was the U.S. Civil War. And that's not a coincidence because in some, uh, partly, uh, the Canadian um, the foundation of, uh, of, of Federal Canada was also a reaction uh, to the U.S. Civil War because until that point um, when the North was not really dominating because the domination of the North in the United States was only decided in the Civil War, um, it was, um, uh, Canada had not really to fear an expansion from the United States to the North because there was always this uh, counterbalance between the North and the South. And the Southern states would have never um, agreed to um, conquering ter territories to the North which are slave free. So you can also here see um, a, a clear security rationale. Then economic reasons are very often very important. 
And uh, here you can see that in both uh, North American federal states that uh, the aim was to create a market from coast to coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, in order to have also economies of scale, to have um, advantages from uh, the big size of the territory and uh, economic actors. And then a third um, um, reason behind uh, the formation of federal states is also large territory and large population. So if we have a look here at this map of uh, federal states, it is always very difficult to delineate um, the, 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 um, um, and define federal systems and which federal systems are not fully fledged federal systems. So there are some uh, tricky cases on this map, but according to different definitions, there are 25 to 30 uh, federal states uh, in the world. But on the other hand, 40% of the world's population lives under a federal constitution. And what you can see here, all the yellow um, in different shades of uh, countries in different shades of yellow are considered, according to different definitions, as federal. So you can see here it is primarily large countries, large countries in terms of territories, in terms of uh, population as well. So what then about the People's Republic of China? Of course, China is huge and is usually not considered as a fully-fledged federal state, but still there are some elements of decentralization at, at work in, in, in China. You have, for example, special economic zones which have more governmental flexibility and also um, have a more market-driven uh, uh, economic orientation. So you have certain zones where you have um, more autonomy than in other parts uh, of China. So still there as well you have some elements um, just because of the uh, size of the territory that mandate somehow um, decentralization in practice. Then a fourth um, rationale and uh, a reason which is indeed very important is the vertical division of power to protect individual rights. So how are individual rights usually protected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most directly with the Bill of Rights, but that was not the case in the United States in, 18, uh, in, in, 19, uh, in 1787. But, of course, also feder uh, federalism was um, uh, seen by the founding fathers of the United States as a check on the majority, as you said before, a separation of powers, so in different branches, to have uh, the legislative branch, to have the executive branch, and to have the judiciary. But... What was the rationale of James Madison, one of the founding fathers of, uh, or the founding father, main founding father of uh, uh, U.S. federalism? It was a double security. So to have beyond just this horizontal um, differentiation of power in different branches of government, also a vertical division of power to secure uh, and safeguard um, individual rights, to have different levels of government, to have not only the national government, but have also the states and also the local governments uh, um, beneath that. And there is a very um, a quote that I like very much from the Federalist number uh, 51, James Madison, who said that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But as government is usually men over men, you must first enable the government to control the governed, but then in the next place you have also obliged the government uh, to control itself. So this is the rationale of uh, checks and balances uh, that you uh, mentioned, uh, just mentioned before. So it's another dimension of security against uh, um, excesses of democracy as the founding fathers uh, had seen it uh, that would uh, infringe individual rights. Then the last point which I would like to make here, um, why um, federal systems are, are created. Uh, especially over the last decades, um, this rationale has taken center stage. Um, and this is the rationale of uh, the management of ethnocultural diversity. So the management of multinational states has become over time more and more important uh, for federalism. So you had such an element, of course, also during uh, the creation of, uh, of, uh, of federal Switzerland in 1848. You can see the nice quote up there by Denis de Rougemont. Together we defend the right to remain different. And uh, you had such an element, of course, also in, in Canada, 1867. We will come back to that later on. 
but especially afterwards, there was India and then uh, in the, uh, after the, uh, in the 1990s, you have a huge increase of um, federalism in ethno-culturally diverse societies. Um, that ranges from uh, Belgium, which is uh, an officially, at least according to its uh, uh, constitution, officially recognized federal state since 1993, uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, um, uh, uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, up until uh, the Nepalese constitution in 2015. Of course, um, all these consti federal constitutions have had more and more success in managing uh, ethnocultural diversity, but at least this, that was the rationale behind adopting uh, a federal system. Um, so another important distinction, important uh, categorization is then uh, how are federal systems formed? And I guess you have uh, touched upon that already, so I'll go that quite quick, uh, through that quite quickly, just to refresh uh, um, uh, your memory on that. So there have been coming together federations where smaller entities have pooled their sovereignty in what we could call a federal big bang. So there is an initial compact between uh, the previously sovereign uh, entities and examples, the primary example here uh, is the United States, but also uh, Switzerland might be an example. Both have transitioned to a fully fledged federal state from a confederation as uh, Professor Rani has uh, explained to you in, in a preceding uh, lecture. But more recently, um, federal systems have come into place through a holding together process. So what that is, does that mean? Previously, unitary states have decentralized and sometimes these unitary states were also authoritarian. Think about uh, Franco-East Spain, where um, the constitution of 1978 with the, st with the different autonomous communities was um, uh, a reaction then, a counter-reaction, and in a part of the transi transition from uh, the Francoist regime. And uh, so this is to hold the state together and to accommodate claims by different ethno-cultural uh, ethno groups. And that also implies then, or results in a more asymmetrical uh, design of, uh, of uh, such federal systems um, uh, in most cases. Then that's maybe a category that you haven't um, uh, um, dealt with in, in, the, in the previous lecture. Um, sometimes um, federal systems can be characterized as being the result of putting together uh, federalism. So this means that there is no compact whatsoever, not even not uh, an initial compact um, as in the United States or later a tacitly concluded compact um, in, in a holding together fe uh, federal system. So there is no um, compact and no free agreement between the different entities forming part of this federation at all, but it's imposed, it's through coercion that the federal system is uh, created. And this coercion, or at least strong influence, let's say, might be um, exercised, this influence might be exercised by a former colonial power. So it is very interesting to see that um, the British, they were very fond, uh, fond of spreading uh, federal systems during the period of decolonization while they at, at home themselves um, uh, resisted uh, federalization of, uh, of the United Kingdom um, since the 19th century. They had been uh, in order to uh, accommodate claims by the Irish, for example, um, the proposal to create, to federalize, to decentralize uh, Britain, but it was only abroad that uh, the British endorsed um, uh, federalism. Then sometimes it's the international community which uh, also uh, imposes, um, uh, imposes uh, a federal system. You can see that uh, very much so in the case of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. You just have to be aware that the Bosnian constitution was just an annex to the Dayton Agreement, which ended the war. So it's just, it was an annex to the Dayton Agreement and the authentic languages of the constitution are English and French and not the local languages. So that also, um, um, uh, indicates uh, how much this, um, this, uh, um, <coughs> this element of, uh, of outside influence was and the lack of local ownership. And that is a problem that uh, persists until today. And sometimes it's also a hegemonic entity uh, which is um, in imposing uh, 
um, uh, the federal system. That was, for example, the case in the Soviet Union with uh, the Russian part, the RSFSR, of course, being the economically and demographically uh, and in terms of territory uh, clearly dominating uh, entity. You can see it here, all the yellow parts, uh, the Russian Republic, one of the 15 uh, component parts, the 15 um, autonomous republics within the Soviet Union. So here you can, of course, also see that there was quite an imbalance of power here uh, at play. So, of course, these are ideal categories, these three, and quite often uh, it is um, the um, formation of um, federal states um, follows some hybrid processes which mix uh, either two or three of the aforementioned uh, patterns. For example, in the case of India, you had all three of these different uh, elements. Just, just to show you a map of India uh, after during the process of decolonization, all that is white there is British India. So that was directly under the control of uh, the British. Then what is um, green here those are um, Indian states and territories um, which were before princely states. So there were 565 princely states and those were under suzerainty of the British. That meant there was some level of control from the British, but within uh, this suzerainty arrangement, these princely states had internal autonomy. So the princely states, they joined the, uh, the Indian Federation by coming together um, while they were also, sometimes also by force, uh, they were forced to, forced to join uh, uh, federal India, while the, red part, the, the white parts here, um, there was a holding together process and the process of decentralization. And at the same time, there was also, of course, uh, the British still played uh, a huge role in this um, federalization process during the decolonization. So there is also a putting together element. So in the case of India, you have with different um, uh, um, weight, of course, uh, all three uh, dynamics uh, at place. So um, let's have a look now on uh, the origins of our three cases that I would like to um, uh, deal with uh, today more in depth. So what was new about uh, federal, the federal United States as opposed uh, to the Articles of Confederation, which you have already um, um, learned about uh, during uh, your previous le uh, lectures. So first, the federal constitution was the supreme law. So this meant that uh, the states participated in the amendment, but unlike the Articles of Confederation, there was no unanimous decision uh, anymore needed, but it was um, uh, an, an, an amendment formula under uh, Article 5, we will return to that later, was, um, uh, uh, was, was introduced and uh, what is another result from the status of having a federal constitution which is a supreme law was also that uh, the practice of judicial review developed. I don't know whether you have um, introduced already the case Marbury versus Madison. You will study it all through, all through your career um, uh, here at the university certainly. A very important case and uh, you can see here what is, um, what is written um, on the U.S. Justice de uh, Department. This is um, uh, a picture taken from there. Uh, and that is a quote from this case by Chief Justice John Marshall. And he said, it is emphatically the province and duty of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. To say what the law is. So this is uh, very important. So the Judicial Department here means the judiciary, the whole uh, judicial branch is meant here. And he said that in order for, um, for judges to be able to decide cases, if there is uh, a conflict between the constitution and an ordinary law, there has to be some rule if there is a conflict because the, the judge has to know which uh, law applies because otherwise uh, it is just uh, arbitrary. Okay, uh, one time I give a precedence to the, to, the, to the ordinary law and another time to the constitution and so um, um, uh, with this case, judicial review of ordinary legislation against the background of the Constitution was introduced. So there is a precedence of the Constitution as the supreme law, and this is also uh, enforced by, uh, uh, by the courts through the practice of judicial review. Uh, 
Then uh, a second important point, what was new in 1787, was the direct effect and the extensive scope of federal legislation. So this means before um, there had to be a process of transposition of uh, the lawmaking that was done under the Articles of, Confed of the Confederation, and it was not directly applicable what was decided in the Congress, in the old Congress under the, uh, under the, the Articles of, of the Confederation. And there was an extensive scope as well of the federal legislation. So um, there were clearly uh, spelled out enumerated powers in the Constitution, and powers were not only delegated above. So that is a different difference um, as opposed to the, uh, to the Articles of, Con of Confederation. And federal legislation was then, the, the, the scope of federal legislation was then further extended uh, through the interpretation of the Supreme Court. We will then uh, return to that when I talk about the evolution of, uh, feder of uh, federalism in the United States. A, th a third very important, um, a third very important um, uh, novelty was the Senate, to have a Senate with equal representation of the states. And here again, what is an important point here to make, uh, that the so-called Great Compromise, or it is also sometimes called the Connecticut Compromise, um, was a bargain which, upon which the United States are founded. And only afterwards, James Madison, in order to uh, push back against uh, critique by the so-called anti-federalists who were opposed to the federal constitution, he, uh, some, he justified this comp uh, compromise and, um, uh, and called it uh, the equal representation in the Senate. So there are two senators, as you know, there are two senators per state in the, in the U.S. Senate, as the result of co-equal societies. But actually, it was just a bargain. It was just a bargain. There was no theoretical reasoning behind uh, having a Senate with equal rep representation. It was only afterwards exposed that Madison said, okay, this is uh, because we are all co-equal co uh, as, as states, and that's why we have uh, two senators each. So just to have a look at this nice uh, slide here. So how did uh, the founding fathers arrive at the um, Connecticut Compromise? So first, um, how is uh, the composition at the moment of the House of Representatives and of the, of the Senate? Are they composed differently or in the same way? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And uh, this new composition that you, um, of the two chambers that you uh, just mentioned was the outcome of the merging of two different plans. So there was first the Virginia plan, the so-called large state plan, which foresaw uh, two chambers of parliament, but um, the basis for representation there would be population. So, of course, it's quite clear that the large states were in favor of that plan because they would have uh, more, uh, more uh, MPs, more votes there. And there was the New Jersey plan, on the other hand, which was proposed with uh, a single, uh, a unicameral parliament, so only a one-chamber parliament, um, with equal representation. And so what the Connecticut Compromise did was just to, put, to merge these two plans and find a compromise between the two. And something which I, of course, uh, would like to uh, stress as well is the th so-called three-fifths compromise, which uh, applied to the House of Re Representatives because there was an incredible, um, um, how to say, um, uh, um, inconsequential thinking behind what the southern states had, um, uh, had demanded because they said, um, uh, of course, uh, we are a slave-holding uh, society, but we want to have uh, in, in the House of Representatives, among the, the population, we want to have uh, slaves counted as one. So on the, on, the, on the one hand, of course, there were slaves, did not have any rights, but, uh, and were treated as property. But on the other hand, in order to have the, their own 
egoistic benefit uh, to have more uh, representation in the House of Representatives, they said they should be counted as one. And of course, the northern states said, okay, no, you can't treat uh, slaves as property, and on the other hand, to count them as fully equal uh, just for your benefit to have more representatives there. So again, a compromise was struck, was struck that any slave would be worth, in inverted commas, three-fifths of uh, a, a, um, an adult uh, who had the right to vote. So again, you could see here, uh, it's incredible, the, the bargaining that took place, and there was n not really a theoretical reasoning behind neither the composition of the House of Representatives nor of the, uh, of, of the Senate uh, that was coherent. So let's have a look now in Canada and then uh, at, uh, at Germany, and then I guess we'll have a break. So first, the origins of Canada. Again, it is a package deal. So it is, again, bargaining as in the US case, but who was bargaining there? So Canada, uh, according to uh, a view uh, that has that prevailed for a very long time, uh, was composed of two founding nations. So which ones are they, the two founding nations? But maybe if you think of the languages that are predominant in Canada, the two predominant languages, English and French, yeah, yeah, of course. So it was, of course, the two conquerors, the two settlers, settler communities, English and, uh, and, and French speaking, uh, which were dominating at the time. And they were thus also, of course, able to uh, dominate the bargaining process that led to, the, to federal Canada in 1867. And you can see that still here, there were two men. You can see here uh, Cartier and uh, MacDonald. And those two men, they were uh, actually the, the main negotiators for the French speaking and for the, for the, for the uh, English speaking communities. And you can see here still that uh, the bridge that connects Ottawa with uh, Gatineau in Quebec it's called uh, the MacDonald Cartier br uh, Bridge. And also the Ottawa um, Airport, for example, is called the MacDonald Cartier Airport. So we can also see visibly here in, in daily life this dualism, which um, was the initial perception uh, of Canada, represented by especially these uh, two men. So it was, as um, uh, a Canadian observer said, a historical compromise between nationalizing modernizers and regional traditionalists. So what does that mean? The English-speaking economic elite, represented uh, in the first place by um, MacDonald, had an interest in having, as you said before, a, a large market from coast to coast, to have economic powers at the national level. And on the other hand, uh, there were the French speakers, of course, uh, in, what in, in Quebec, what, is, what was then uh, denominated Quebec in 1867, which then said, okay, uh, we can uh, give our consent to that, but we have to have uh, cultural rights, um, uh, linguistic rights at the provincial level. So in the we in, in the province of Quebec want to have some autonomy in that regard. Uh, so that's why uh, this compromise uh, came, in, came in place. But then, of course, there are also the so-called First Nations. Who do you think are the First Nations? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So indigenous uh, populations that was there, of course, long before the arrival of the French and of the, uh, of the English. And they denominated themselves also in order to stress that they were the first ones there, the so-called First Nations. And there are uh, almost 300 of them and uh, also the, the Inuit people are not counted in, uh, in, 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 uh, among these First Nations, so they are uh, a separate community that exists as well. And only in uh, 1982 uh, was this, uh, were these First Nations uh, recognized in the Constitution, and treaties were concluded, then constitutionalized, because there, is, um, there are treaty relationships between uh, the, the Canadian government and the different tribes, and constitutional re recognition came only in 1982, although they make up today um, about 3% of the, of the population of Canada. So, um, 
Canada was founded in um, so federal Canada was founded in 87 eight, in, uh, uh, in 1867 through the British North America Act and that already tells you something because it was a, the British North America Act so it was a, um, a, a, an act a piece of legislation that was adopted by uh, the Westminster Parliament that um, brought into being uh, federal Canada and you can see it here uh, that's a, a picture of the act it's an, an act of the Imperial Parliament to the right here for the Union of Canada Nova Scotia and New Brunswick so Canada so those were the, the f there were four initial provinces in Canada because Canada um, what is here said as Canada uh, um, mentioned as Canada that is um, would include both Quebec and Ontario what is today Ontario and Quebec so you have three Ontario and Quebec the third one Nova Scotia and the fourth one uh, New Brunswick as the initial parts of federal Canada and then other ones uh, as Canada expanded to the west uh, other new components of the Federation uh, were created let's have a look at it here so the center of course the historical center of federal Canada was to the towards the east you can see here in uh, what's that strange color um, yellow orange you can see here Ontario and Quebec and to the right you can see in pink or uh, in light pink and dark pink New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and then of course with the westward expansion very much like in the case of the United States uh, other uh, provinces were created so that there are today 10 provinces and three territories with a minor autonomy status uh, within Canada so but there was a, a, a second formative moment uh, for uh, Canada where Canada was so, in some extent to some extent refounded and that was in 19, 1982 so certain developments led to a constitutional reform in 19, uh, 1982 so first in, in the 1960s the so-called quiet revolution la révolution tranquille which meant uh, a, a more liberal kind of nationalism nationalism developed in in Quebec and uh, which was driven by an economically strong middle class so that there was new self consciousness in Quebec and that resulted also in political claims and that time in the 1970s the Prime Minister of Canada was Trudeau not the one from, from today of course it was his father uh, Justin Trudeau uh, of course Pierre Trudeau so <laughs> uh, so Justin's father Pierre Trudeau was the, the Prime Minister in the 1970s and his strategy was a little bit different than what uh, Quebec claimed at the time so his vision of Canada was so-called pan-Canadianism so he thought of Canada as being a bilingual country so no special um, uh, special um, not to have um, a predominantly French-speaking Quebec and predominantly Anglophone other provinces he wanted to have a wholly bilingual Canada uh, through all the, uh, the, the provinces but then um, Canada, uh, Quebec said ah we are not really quite quite happy with this, pro this, pro this proposal because anyway if there are equal is there equal status between the languages then uh, because of just the, the, the larger number of speakers of English English would predominate so um, the Quebec government of the time was not happy with that and that led in 1976 to um, the election of the Parti Québécois so PQ here on the slide uh, the Parti Québécois wanted independence wanted um, not outright independence and what it really wanted was sovereignty association so there was something in between so in some respects uh, there should be still um, um, an association between Canada and a sovereign Quebec for example in terms of currency uh, monetary policy and so on so there were some uh, um, some elements of um, of staying together even though they campaigned for uh, sovereignty for Quebec and they lost the referendum in 1980 but what was very important that um, on the eve of um, of the referendum um, in order to uh, to boost the no campaign um, the federal prime minister Pierre Trudeau made a proposal of what he called renewed federalism so you can also there is a similar development uh, was also there at uh, uh, in with the Scotland referendum where there was also the so-called the pledge 
of uh, the three national party leaders who uh, promised on the eve of the, the vote uh, more uh, autonomy, so-called devolution max, um, to, to extend the autonomous status. So this, is, of course, was his proposal in, in order to uh, shift uh, the voters uh, to, uh, to a no to sovereignty association. But part of this renewed federalism that uh, Trudeau proposed was uh, a deal to reform um, the, the, the Canadian Constitution. So why was that important? Because up until then, the constitutional amendment was still made by the British, by the British Parliament. So there was no, uh, amend there was no uh, local um, ownership of uh, Canada regarding constitutional amendment because um, they had full legislative uh, independence in terms of ordinary legislation since the Statute of West Westminster in 1931. But back at that time, there was no consensus on an amendment formula. So Canada itself, the Canadian institutions, could not amend uh, the Canadian Constitution. It was uh, the British uh, Parliament who, uh, um, uh, who was responsible for that. And that changed in 1982 with the so-called patriation. The constitution was patriated. It was uh, brought in, in patria uh, to, a certain, uh, to a certain extent. And there were three very important elements that changed in 1982. The first one was uh, that, again, the constitution of Canada was a, a supreme law and was the standard of judicial review. So like in, the, in 1787 in the US case. So it's the same first bullet point also here. Then there was a genuinely Canadian amendment formula was, uh, um, um, uh, was found. And the third very important um, element is that a Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, Freedoms was introduced. There had not been a Bill of Rights before 19, uh, 1982, uh, a consolidated one. So um, it was very important that um, this uh, charter, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, was then also the basis for judicial review, because judicial review was already um, before recognized regarding the distribution of powers, but then afterwards, um, most of the, the vast majority of the cases in front of the uh, Canadian Supreme Court were on um, conflicts between legislation, either federal legislation, ordinary legislation, or provincial legislation, with this Charter of Canadian Charter of Rights, because of course the Canadian Charter of Rights, as being constitutional, trumped both ordinary federal and ordinary provincial legislation, and that was very much uh, opposed by Quebec, because uh, some important pieces of legislation of the Quebec government were declared unconstitutional because they um, conflicted with certain charter rights. So, um, last case, Germany, very quickly. Um, and then in five minutes, uh, let's have a break. So the, the, the main drivers of federalism in Germany was not diversity, as we said before, diversity was an element in the Canadian case and in various uh, other cases afterwards. But it was essentially a matter of history, both of the old empire, the Holy Roman Empire, and also the past of uh, Nazi rule. For example, if you have a look here at the Holy Roman Empire in 1648, what happened in 1648? Very important date. Which peace treaties were concluded? So the Peace of Westphalia. If you uh, look here at this map, you see here numerous tiny territories which all had within, since medieval times, within the Holy Roman Empire, under the empire, who had, of course, some sort of, like the suzerainty that I mentioned before uh, of the British in India, who had some, some control somewhere above, but somewhere above. <coughs> and there was autonomy of these tiny, sometimes really tiny entities uh, within these large empires. And these were princes, bishops, uh, who ruled uh, certain territories. So um, this was the structure of uh, the Holy Roman Empire um, until its demise. And that, of course, was very important um, to have this tradition of autonomous territories, which to some extent then also 
um, was a determinant factor for the creation of, of, uh, of the German federa federal state. Then, it was also a counter-reaction, the basic law of, 19, of uh, 1949, against the centralized uh, Nazi rule. So, there had been already uh, in uh, 1932, in a very important court case, very interesting court case, I leave that for now because there is no time, you can f find it in the book. Um, there had been um, the, um, uh, an emergency degree, decree that was declared um, with which um, the, the German government declared the social democratic Prussian government um, dismissed. And this dismissal of uh, the Prussian government was then declared constitutional by uh, the Staatsgerichtshof, so by the Sub uh, Su Supreme Court back at that time. And that, of course, also uh, um, enormously we weakened the position not only of Prussia, but also of different other uh, lenders back at that time. And then, in one year later, the Nazis abolished the lender outright, so in 1933. So, what happened then afterwards, after the war? After the war, um, the, the lender were, were re-established in all four uh, zones, also in the Soviet zone, although then in the uh, German Democratic Republic in East Germany they were later on abolished. There were no lender until 1990 in the, in, in the no autonomous lender in the east of Germany until 1990. But um, they persisted in the three other zones, so the French, the British and uh, the US uh, zones uh, in what, was, what then would become um, Western Germany. So the system that was then created, which was a unitary, quite centralized system, and also co cooperative system of federalism, was very much, think again of the different categories of coming together, holding together, putting together, a compromise between the lender, which happened under the supervision of the Allied powers. Of course, the Allied powers had influence in the constitution-making process, but the so-called uh, Herren Kiemse uh, draft, which was Herren Kiemse, so um, a very nice place to go there, by the way. It's very much in the south, very close uh, from here, so maybe a yeah. three hours drive. And uh, this was the place where um, uh, a draft, a very important draft of the Basic Law was deliberated. And um, it was deliberated by the so-called Parliamentary Council. And the Parliamentary Council uh, was... Uh, composed of lender, uh, lender uh, politicians because the lender had been re-established before the basic law and also um, many lender, in, lender constitutions had been in place and operative before the, before the federal constitution, before the, the, the basic law and that's why there was uh, a lot of lender influence on, uh, on, the, on the basic law even though under the supervision of, uh, of the allied powers. So last point before the break, 1990 of course again a very important federal constitutional moment uh, for Germany. But what happened then was that no new co federal constitution was created. There was no referendum when uh, the German reunification was effected. But the Eastern German, East, East Germany joined the existing federation. So there was no uh, referendum uh, there but they were just admitted to the existing federations, the five new lenders, so that you have uh, 16 lenders now, so the 11 old ones and the five uh, new lenders. And again, also in 1990, there was no referendum, even if Article 146 of the German Constitution would have foreseen the possibility of creating a new constitution and having a referendum, there was no referendum in 1990, neither was there a referendum in uh, 1949. So you can see, again, it was a package deal uh, made by politicians after long bargaining uh, procedures, um, uh, which led to the creation of the basic law. So this is the point, the last point that I would like to make, uh, because that really links uh, all three cases, uh, so that uh, constitutions are package deals resulting from uh, bargaining in most cases, and they are not really planned theoretically uh, with all steps in advance, with a foresight into the future. So, um, so it's 12, I think, 12 and 2 minutes, so let's have a break of uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Is the microphone on? Ah, now it's on. Okay, perfect. <laughs>
So I do not want to start now the second part without asking whether there are any questions, uh, some demands for clarification regarding the first uh, part. If something comes to your mind, then of course you can ask me afterwards, so there will still be time then uh, to, to discuss different issues. So uh, the first part was about why, con why uh, federal systems are formed, how they are formed, and about the origins of three our three cases, the United States, Canada, and, um, and Germany. So now it is about, the second part is about the evolution of these three systems. So as we uh, keep in mind the, slide, the first slide about the physics, so first there is, from the trajectory, there is first a begin point, and then there is a process. So we'll now look at the process. Um, so the question is, because we said that there are um, package deals um, at place usually when uh, federal systems are formed. So one important question is whether this one deal should be binding forever. And that is a very uh, important question. Does anyone know these two gentlemen here? I mean, they look quite similar actually. So the, how they look into the camera, also how they are dressed. So both are two main founding fathers of the United States. To the left you have uh, Mr. Jefferson, to the right you have Mr. Madison. And concerning the question of the evolution of constitutions and also federal constitutions, and that is very important, they had quite different opinions. So uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, said the following. So one generation has no more right to rule the next as it has to rule another country. That's why he said he is for constitutional change. The constitution should be replaced every 20 years, in his view. So no rigid constitution. And he had a quite interesting argument for that, because he said that um, all the population that is uh, older than 21 years, so which has the voting age, um, would be half of this population would uh, be dead and would then be replaced after 18 years and 8 months back at that time. Of course, now there, had be, uh, there would have to be uh, quite different calculations. And that's why he said, okay, he rounded it up to, to 20 years, that every 20 years a country should have a new constitution. And uh, I learned something very interesting when I was at the conference in Switzerland last week, that this is still something that is practiced by some states. So there will be a vote in the state of New York in a few days, and this vote takes place every 20 years about, there should be, about whether there should be a constitutional convention to draft a new state constitution. So you can see that uh, at the state constitutional level until now. So, but what did Mad Madison say here? Madison said that uh, a rigid, rigid constitution, to some extent rigid constitution, is not inconsistent with the principles of democracy, but he said it's really a precondition for democracy to work because the actors within a democratic process, they have to have some uh, fixed rules by which they play. So they have to have some fixed rules um, to stick to, and that makes uh, the democratic process then a constitutionalized uh, democratic process. So um, what I'll have a look now at is uh, how constitutional evolution in these three federal systems has taken place since the founding that we um, dealt with in the first uh, uh, part of the lecture. And I will differentiate between three different uh, drivers for change, three different processes of change. The first one is constitutional amendment. So this is the, the clearest and most obvious, um, um, uh, obvious uh, way through which a constitution may change. The second one is constitutional interpretation, which is performed by a, a constitutional court or by a Supreme Court. And the third one is what I call here, and it's actually not my quote, but the constitution outside of the constitution. I will explain later on uh, what that means. And in the different countries that um, uh, we deal with today, of course, it's always a mixture between these different um, uh, patterns of evolution, but I'll try to look uh, regarding the constitutional amendment at Germany, because in, in Germany there have been, of course, notwithstanding the huge role of the federal constitutional court in interpreting the constitution, many um, constitutional changes that really made an impact on how federalism worked in Germany since 1949. So, um, 
What is important here is the, uh, the amendment formula in Germany consists only of two-thirds of uh, the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. So uh, there is no, as opposed to the, to the, to the United States, where you have uh, a ratification process of a constitutional amendment also through three-fourths of the states. Also three-fourths of the states have to, uh, uh, to ratify a new constitution. But still, through uh, the representation, the strong role of the lender in the Bundesrat, in the Federal Council, still the lender have uh, an enormous influence on, um, on uh, constitutional amendments, on formal constitutional amendments. What is then very important here is that some parts of the German constitution, they are beyond amendability. They cannot be even amended if there was a, cons a, a consensus. Um, um, and these uh, parts are, for example, the participation of the lender in the legislative process in principle, so not how they participate in the lawmaking process at the national level, but that they um, uh, participate in the process. So that is one important thing. The other important thing is, of course, the fundamental rights catalog. You can see that on the screen, so Articles 1 to 19 of, uh, of the Bundeslaw, and the constitutional principles that are enshrined in Article 20 of the Bundeslaw. And the fourth very important uh, topic, which is beyond uh, amendability, is the territorial division of Germany into Länder. So this raised the question whether um, federalism might be amended in Germany or not. So the question is whether a single country, a, sing a single land, ha um, has to give its consent to being abolished, or whether the territorial structure of Germany is uh, to some extent flexible. And uh, there was a very important constitutional court case, the so-called Southwest State case. You can see here the situation in the Southwest of Germany after World War II. So there was a, a vote on creating what is today Baden-Württemberg. And uh, for the purpose of that vote, uh, what you can see here is Baden was split up in two districts for the voting process. So you can he see here also on the, on the right uh, uh, a campaign picture for, um, for merging those, uh, those lenders. So there was the option of either merging those two lenders into Baden-Württemberg to create this, south, this huge southwest state or not. And what the constitutional court then had to decide was uh, whether Baden, which was against this, uh, this merger, whether they, uh, this uh, land, this historically grown land, could be abolished without its consent or not. Because for the purpose of the, of the vote, Baden was uh, div divided in two parts, so in the northern part and the southern, southern part. And the Constitutional Court said, actually, this does not really um, uh, violate the principles of democracy and federalism, as was claimed by the government of, of Baden, but because the, 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 Germ the German basic law foresees certain explicit procedures for territorial reorganization, and it was um, 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 introduced, it was characterized as a malleable federal state, a federal state which uh, does not have a fixed, forever a fixed constitutional uh, federal, federal structure, uh, territorial structure. So Germany, um, the, the principle of territorial division has to be, has, uh, uh, is not amendable. So Germany has to have some territorial divisions, but this might be only two as well. So it has to be, so federalism is, uh, is safeguarded that way, but a single land does not have um, uh, uh, a veto right against its own abolition. And at that case, um, before this uh, vote, this was really very important because if, um, so um, uh, if um, there wouldn't have been the split of Baden into north and south, with one, the north uh, being in favor and the south being against it. And it was only, uh, the formula said that only one district uh, can be against uh, the, the merger. Um, if we, it would have been counted the whole of Baden, then they would have um, voted against uh, the merger. So there, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
what was what uh, the land Baden did, they challenged uh, in before the Constitutional Court that Baden, the historic land, was divided into two parts. And this was strategi strategically done that way in order to split up the votes because the, the, the rules of this law uh, regulating the referendum said that uh, the merger is approved if uh, three of the four uh, voting di districts are uh, in favor of the merger. And it was clear that, or it was, was um, uh, highly likely, that Baden as a whole would, um, uh, would vote against it. So um, there was a split between the north and the south. And if there would have been uh, really all Baden counted together, then there would, be, would have been really a veto right against, uh, against uh, the merger. So this was a clear, um, um, uh, pros um, clear uh, gerrymandering uh, strategy uh, in this uh, in this uh, f uh, referendum legislation in order to uh, separate and split up these votes uh, in in Baden. So that's why he made uh, a difference. Sorry, 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 and so gerrymandering is um, a politically motivated uh, drawing of of uh, of manipulation, drawing of boundaries, usually for uh, parliamentary elections, in order to favor one party over the other. And here it was also a politically motivated. Um, move in order to split up uh, the, the, the votes of, of Baden. And here, uh, what, the, the, what was the result of, of, uh, of, the, of the ruling was that federal structure um, has to be there. Territorial division is in principle uh, something that, has to, that, is, uh, that is beyond amendment, but not the abolition of, uh, of, um, but the abolition of, of a single land is not uh, necessarily um, subject to a veto of uh, of the land. So, um, why is it is it interesting to, s to look at Germany regarding constitutional amendment? Because especially the financial constitution in Germany uh, has been uh, repeatedly amended um, uh, through that formal process. So, financial con con constitution is a, a very German term. And there is a whole long Title 10 of the Basic Law, which uh, really in detail regulates the different uh, fiscal powers. And even the beer tax, for example, is something uh, that is regulated in the Constitution. So uh, the beer tax is uh, an exclusive tax of the lender. So that is not somehow uh, in some ordinary law, but that is really constitutionalized. So you can see here, um, in terms of financial affairs, financial relations, the com German Constitution is very important. Then, um, what was um, a very important de development was that so-called broad-based taxes, because there are, of course, minor taxes like the beer tax, of course, as, as I said before, but there are the main taxes are always um, individual income tax, um, 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 corporate income tax, and turnover taxes, so sales taxes. Those are the three taxes who really make up most of uh, the generation of the uh, of generating uh, income for governments, and. You had uh, before, in 1949, you had the income taxes as exclusive lender taxes. On the other hand, you had the turnover tax as an exclusive federal tax. And then, to, through two subsequent uh, reforms, uh, they were made shared taxes. So you can see here how important these uh, constitutional amendments were in 1955 and 1969, respectively, because they changed the whole system of taxation from exclusive uh, fiscal powers to uh, joint taxes, which are until now uh, very important. A second um, important um, um, topic is what it happens if one land is in, a case, is, is in a situation of extreme fiscal stress. So that is something that also, to some extent, uh, resulted from uh, the limited uh, own um, uh, fiscal powers, and on the other hand, the lender had uh, unlimited bo uh, borrowing uh, capacity. So this led in, in certain uh, lender, for example in Bremen and in the Saarland, uh, from the 1970s onwards, to um, uh, an increase in their uh, debts. So the question was then, uh, should there be a bailout by the federal government of these lender, which were in a situation of extreme fiscal stress. And the Constitutional Court said, so this is of course a question that was also um, with uh, Greece and several other countries, so there's also something that is at the European level a very topical issue and 
that was then back then uh, a very topic issue between the federal government in Germany and uh, the lender governments. And what the Constitutional Court said was that uh, the characterization in the Constitution of Germany as a social federal state, so not only a federal state, but a social federal state, um, means that the other lender are, um, are obliged to bail out those lender in a fiscal, in, an ex in a situation of extreme fiscal stress. Of course, extreme is then again something that is uh, um, uh, a quite undetermined uh, legal expression and uh, again uh, leaves room for different interpretations. And um, there was some clarification then afterwards what that means, but what is very important that again in 2009, uh, the so-called debt break was, um, was introduced, which um, obliges the, the different lender and also the federal government to an essentially um, balanced budget. And also a stability council was introduced, an institution which is uh, uh, responsible for monitoring um, uh, the, the balanced budgets, budgets of the lender. So you can see here again, both in, one th uh, in 1955 and 1969 uh, with the joint taxes and also with the, 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 the evolution from exclusive taxes to joint taxes and also in 2009, um, formal constitutional amendments were critical in uh, developing uh, the German uh, federal system. So, um, let's look now at the United States. United States, we can have uh, here as an example of the influence of constitutional interpretation. Because as I said before, um, Article 5 of the US Constitution creates quite a rigid uh, constitution. Does anyone know, um, I also hinted at that already before, what, is, what are the requirements for a constitutional amendment in the United States? So there are different procedures, but there is one main, pro main procedure, which uh, all, practically all uh, amendments so far have followed. So it's two-thirds in both houses of parliament, so that would be similar to, the United, so to Germany, but then, as I said before, hinted, hinted at before quite briefly, also three-fourths of the states have to ratify the constitutional amendment. And so this is, of course, something that is especially now in these days of polarization between the red America and blue America, between Republican and Democrat, uh, uh, Democrats, uh, a, a hurdle that is very uh, difficult to take, this uh, three-fourths um, uh, requirement. Um, another feature of the U.S. Constitution is, of course, that it is very old, the oldest federal constitution, fully-fledged federal constitution, and that it's also very short. So the U.S. Constitution has less than 8,000 words, while, for example, the Indian Constitution has almost 148,000 words. So that, of course, so you have very old terminology, which are uh, maybe not even used anymore in today's English language. You have a very short constitution, and that, of course, um, leaves a lot of room and uh, needs a lot of clarification, a lot of interpretation. And that's why, of course, that's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court uh, has played a very important role uh, over time in the United States. So, um, very important, we briefly discussed it also during the break, is the so-called uh, necessary and proper clause, or the elastic clause. So, why do federations have to be elastic? Do you have any, any ideas about that? Because of course, it is very rigid, it is very old, it is very short. Why should it, uh, has it, nevertheless, does it have uh, to be uh, reinterpreted and why does the federal constitution of the United States have to evolve uh, over time? Because it has to adapt to changing circumstances. So there are new social, economic, political circumstances to which a constitution always have to, has to react or it reacts uh, uh, per se. Uh, to these changes. And this clause, the so-called elastic clause, says that um, Congress has all powers to make, uh, has power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. And the foregoing powers are the enumerated powers of the Congress. So what the, there are different subjects ranging from commerce to taxation to raising an army, which are enumerated powers by the Congress.
And then this clause says, in order to efficiently um, um, uh, bring into execution to exercise these enumerated powers, you should have all that is necessary and proper to do that. And that, of course, leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And there was um, a first very important case in 1819 in which it was said that um, all that that means that the, the enumerated powers cannot become meaningless. So this was a bit a narrow interpretation, quite a, quite a uh, restrictive interpretation. Later on, uh, the, constitutional, the Supreme Court said that it is only this clause about external limits. So uh, Congress has ample lawmaking powers, which are only restricted by external limits, such as the Bill of Rights and uh, federalism. So it uh, gave a lot of leeway uh, to the Congress and thus to federal legislation. Uh, more recently, again, in the case uh, Prince versus United States, also a, an, uh, a case interesting to look at more in detail, um, the, the, Constitutional, the Supreme Court has again applied a, more, a bit more limited um, uh, interpretation of this elastic clause. So you can also see that there is a fluctuation of the interpretation of constitution, constitutional interpretation over time, over more than two centuries, of course. So the second clause, which is extremely important in the U.S. case for constitutional in, uh, um, interpretation, is the so-called Commerce Clause, so which says that commerce, uh, the Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. So let's leave aside for now uh, the Indian tribes and foreign nations, but let's look at what is called interstate commerce, so commerce among the several states. And here, um, the, the, the uh, federal constitutional courts was, uh, court was in, eight, in um, 1824, um, had to deal with two uh, men called Gibbons and uh, Ogden. So what was the case about? So both men with their companies wanted to operate steamboats on, waters, uh, of, uh, on the waterways of New York State. And uh, to the left you can see uh, Mr. Ogden, Ogden who said, get out, New York gave me the exclusive right to operate steamships in New York waters. Because the state of New York had given him the monopoly to operate steamships uh, sh steam in the, in the water, on the waterways of the state. But Mr. Gibbons said, because he had a federal license, he said, wrong, New York gave the United States the exclusive right to regulate interstate com commerce. So Mr. Gibbons said, uh, okay, uh, I have a federal license, while Mr. Ogden had the monopoly at the state level. So the question was, they were of course on collision course, of course, here on the picture and also then uh, in a dispute uh, before the, the Supreme Court, they, uh, these two positions and their arguments, they collided with each other. So again, as I said before, Marbury versus Madison, to say what the law is, is the, is the, is the, 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 the ultimate task of the judiciary. Again, the Supreme Court had to say what the law is in that case. And what did he decide? He said, so um, he said that commerce um, is more than pure traffic of goods. It's more than only buying and selling goods. So he applied, uh, uh, the judges applied a very extensive uh, interpretation of uh, what commerce means. It also includes navigation. And it said also that uh, it is important to see whether any economic activity has an interstate impact. So even if, uh, for example, it's only about the waterways within um, New York State, you cannot say that Mr. Gibbons um, um, would not operate uh, steamships also outside of, uh, of the state. So if there is an impact on uh, interstate commerce, if there is some, uh, some, some impact that goes beyond the single state, then uh, the, the commerce clause uh, is at play. So this was a very extensive op uh, 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 interpretation of the commerce clause. In, uh, in two respects, in these two, uh, in these two respects I mentioned, both what is commerce per se, what does it mean commerce, and also what is the territorial scope, so the interstate impact. And um, so later on, the commerce clause has been probably the single most important um, provision in order to extend, to expand the power of federal legislation in the United States, especially 
and you have uh, to think about that between uh, 1937 um, um, uh, and 1995, there was not a single case in which um, um, in which the Supreme Court did not uh, did uh, put limits to the congressional um, power in order to invoke uh, to the, the Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause was the basis of both the New Deal legislation of Franklin D. Roosevelt in uh, the 1930s, and it was also um, the vehicle for the so-called Civil Rights Revolu Revolution, peaking with the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Because the Commerce Clause was, for example, invoked by the, by the Supreme Court judges in order to uh, prohibit discrimination of African Americans in local motels and local um, um, restaurants. Because they said that the economic activities of these restaurants nevertheless have an interstate impact. So there is nothing really local. That was, was what the, the, the uh, Supreme Court said. There is nothing really local because even a local restaurant that discriminates against customers or against business partners uh, which are, who are African-American, uh, still their economic activity is, uh, has an interstate impact and that's why um, um, congressional legislation um, regarding civil rights um, was, uh, uh, was facilitated and was protected through the interpretation of the, of the Commerce Clause. So, uh, a last case which I would like to discuss with you. Um, I said before that judicial review is a very important feature of, um, of, the, of, the, of US federalism. And the question was whether the safeguards of federalism in the US case are indeed judicial or merely political. Because there was a famous case, um, Garcia versus uh, Samta in 1985, in which the um, Supreme Court just said um, this issue at stake is not really a, ca a case of, of uh, judicial review because um, what was, uh, was the case there was that uh, state sovereignty was invoked because up, up until that point uh, state the sovereignty because um, uh, in the United States the states have co-sovereign status with uh, the, the national government so uh, there is a limit that federal uh, powers find into the in, in state sovereignty. But then in 1985, the Supreme Court said that actually state sovereignty is non-justiciable. So... We clarified it is a, a notion of sovereignty that is not technical. Because states are having devolved power to the federation, they are no longer sovereign. According to the constitutional interpretation of the Supreme Court, I mean, that also fluctuated over, over time, um, there has been uh, the qualification of the, of the co-equal status between uh, and the co-sovereign status. Of course, uh, in practice, uh, sovereignty means something else at the national level and at the state level. But in terms of their internal uh, lawmaking capacities, um, the Supreme Court has um, um, approved of and has... Um, uh, confirmed the, 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 the partial residuary uh, sovereignty uh, that the states hold. So um, what was um, the rationale in this case was that uh, the judges followed um, a theory um, um, that was proposed that had been endorsed before already by um, various specialists on the US Constitution, which said the political safeguards theory. And this theory said that uh, the framers of the Constitution, they gave the states a role in the selection of the executive and legis legislative branches of the federal government, and that's the only safeguard for federalism. That's the only sta safeguard for states' rights. So it's not the judges who uh, have to protect the, the um, who have the responsibility to protect the states, but um, in this judgment, they said, following this uh, theory, that it is only political safeguards, because um, to what extent uh, do the states play a role regarding uh, the, the executive and legislative branches at the national level? We said already before, the legislative branch, there is, of course, uh, equal representation in the Senate, but also the executive branch. Of course, the way in which uh, the president, U.S. president, is elected 
So if it would be only votes counted all over, over the United States, then Hillary Clinton would be president now, right? But it is, yeah, <laughs> by quite a, um, um, yeah, by not, not, not even a, a very uh, thin margin. She would have uh, won the, the electoral vote uh, all over the United States. But again, it's the system of the electoral college, right? Which gives different weight to different states, also a bit um, adjusted by population, but still. So that's why what the judges there said, only, there are only political safeguards for federalism through uh, the participation in, uh, the, con in, the, in the composition uh, of uh, the U.S. President, the, 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 the U.S. Senate, and also um, how, in the way how the U.S. President is, is elected, and um, not judicial safeguards. Since then, the um, Supreme Court has reversed this view um, uh, to some extent, and again has started to uh, protect states' rights uh, against uh, intrusion of uh, powers of the, uh, of the federal government. But here again you can see how there is an up and down in the interpretation of different uh, um, clauses of the, of the Constitution. In all these uh, three uh, examples you can see how constitutional interpretation by the Supreme Court has changed uh, over time. So um, our last case, uh, Canada. So constitution, why constitution outside the Constitution? So this is a term which was, um, which was um, uh, shaped especially uh, by Ernest Young in a very interesting uh, article where he said actually it is important to look from a functional perspective as the, uh, at the Constitution. So what does that mean? That means that uh, not only the Constitution is not only what is formally the Constitution, but everything that is, um, uh, that is dealing with constituting the government, because the Constitution is essentially about, as Stephen Holmes said, about enabling and disabling polit uh, uh, political decision-making. So it's constituting the institutions, the procedures, and also disabling their functioning by uh, introducing, for example, bill of, bills of rights in order to set limits and boundaries to um, uh, political decision-making. So that's why um, the Constitution outside the Constitution is, of course, not only what is done through fo formal constitutional amendment, but it also might be ordinary laws or it might be also intergovernmental agreements, for example. Of course, these are, very, these are less entrenched and they are much more vulnerable to change than uh, the, the, the constitution uh, in a proper sense, in a proper formal sense, right? And in the Canadian case, you really had uh, such constitutional change uh, through intergovernmental agreements and through ordinary legislation because there had been, after in, in 1995, there had been a referendum again as uh, in 1980 uh, on a, a somewhat uh, different, uh, different question on the independence of Quebec. You won't remember that, I guess, in 1995, a bit too early. But um, again, the sovereignists, they, won, uh, they, they lost again the vote as in 1980. And... Um, what happened then, uh, um, uh, what had happened before that was um, uh, the so-called uh, period of mega-constitutional politics. So this means it had been tried to find a huge com constitutional compromise, including also Quebec, because as I said before, the Constitution Act of 1982 was, did not include the consent of Quebec. So there were two uh, accords, two, two agreements which were tried in order to change the constitution formally, to change uh, to, and to get Quebec on board of the constitutional compromise. But both failed. So what was the, stra the strategy then after this so-called mega constitutional politics uh, had failed to produce any, any results? There was a shift towards the constitution outside the constitution, uh, as I explained it before. So on a sub-constitutional level, an extra-constitutional level with instruments outside the Constitution, it was tried to accommodate somehow the claims of uh, Quebec. So for example, there have been afterwards, after 1995, parliamentary resolutions in which um, uh, Quebec was, um, uh, was recognized as a distinct society, so as being to be something special within Canada. And it was also granted uh, de facto a veto on constitutional amendments uh, through a parliamentary resolution. 
in another parliamentary motion of the, of, the, of the Canadian Parliament, Quebec was recognized as a nation within a united Canada. So again here, these are steps to accommodate somehow the claims of uh, Quebec, which had not been uh, accommodated through uh, um, a real formal constitutional amendment, which had uh, uh, failed before. And also, uh, as another factor was intergovernmental agreements were concluded, um, which um, also uh, enabled Quebec to opt out of certain policies. For example, from social policies, um, um, there is the Social uh, Union Framework Agreement of 1999, for example, which gave Quebec the right to have its own social policy and to be compensated for that. So to have an opt out from, uh, from uh, the national social policy, policy uh, regime and also have its own regime and getting all, also paid for it. So you can see here again, it was not through constitutional, constitutional amendment that the constitution de facto changed, but through parliamentary resolutions, intergovernmental agreements and so on, extra constitutional uh, sources. So what was um, to conclude that the, what were the upsides and the downsides of uh, this strategy? So of course, um, there were some small success, successes with this. Um, uh, so there was not a huge uh, compromise of overholding a constitution and uh, finding a new constitutional compromise, but there were these uh, many small steps that were taken and that really led to an abatement of secessionism in Quebec after that. So uh, secessionism in Quebec was contained afterwards with this strategy of constitutional change outside the constitution. On the other hand, of course, uh, this constitutional change again was criticized as being federalism behind closed doors because it was intergovernmental agreements. It was not really uh, a huge um, um, constitutional compromise, which had a lot of transparency, participation, and also um, uh, confirmation in a referendum afterwards. And also, of course, as I said before, these, um, uh, as opposed to a constitutional amendment in a formal sense, this uh, constitutional change through uh, ordinary laws and intergovernmental agreements was less entrenched. It was more vulnerable uh, to being revoked. So to conclude now, um, what is important to, um, to say about federalism from a constitutionalist perspective that it is always, or to my, to my knowledge in, in practically all cases, a constitutional bargain, as uh, William Riker called it in 1964, between the relevant political actors. As I tried to illustrate also with, uh, with, the, um, with the explanations on the origins of the United States, Canada and uh, Germany, it is always uh, bargaining and then um, a, uh, a package deal that is usually found between the different actors. And that's also why federalism always um, means that there is an individual balance of the different interests between the subnational level and uh, the national levels. So there is a very nice quote that, um, that shows that, what is the, is the, the essential uh, nature of, uh, of uh, the compromise, that autonomy, and autonomy is of course one of the hallmarks of federalism next to integration, it's always autonomy and integration. Autonomy is most often only reluctantly granted and usually ungratefully received by those who uh, get autonomy. So this is, uh, I guess, a very telling uh, a quotation. Then I tried to identify different drivers and different patterns of constitutional change um, in federal systems. One was formal constitutional amendment. The other one um, was um, uh, a constitutional interpretation by the Supreme Court or constitutional court, which is uh, a very important feature. And the third one, is uh, constitutional change outside the constitutions. And usually it is many different drivers uh, which are combined. So it's not, even if I fo focus regarding constitutional amendment on, the United, on, on, on Germany, that doesn't mean that constitutional interpretation uh, and uh, intergovernmental relations have not played a role in uh, developing further uh, the German federal, federal system. So to conclude, what are so the trajectory or the trajectories, maybe even in plural, uh, is even better. Um, think about the, the phys physics slide at the beginning. So I would rather um, think of trajectories in plural of mature federal systems. So if we take different categorizations of federal systems, and then we can uh, have a look uh, 
at how um, federal systems have along, evolved along these lines. So first, centralized federal systems and decentralized federal systems. Here you can see that Canada, for example, has been turned on its head because Canada was not even qualified in 1867 by most observers as a real federal system. It was qualified as a quasi-federal system because it had so many centralizing features. But then, through the evolution, it is actually that has taken place in the last uh, 100 and, uh, um, 150 years because there was the 150th anniversary um, uh, not much time ago of uh, the Canadian, uh, of Federal Canada. In the last 150 years, Canada has changed to such an extent that it is today one of the most decentralized federal systems. On the other hand, um, the United States is, uh, uh, has started as a, as, a very, very, as a very decentralized system and, according to many accounts, um, has, has taken a rather, centralization, a, pat a, rather a pattern of centralization. Then a second categorization, a second dichotomy that you have. Uh, there are some federal systems that are more symmetrical and others that are more asymmetrical. And here you can see that uh, Germany and the United States, for example, they have remained rather symmetrical. Whereas in Canada, some asymmetry has been introduced, as I said already before. Uh, there has been, uh, have been opt-outs for, uh, for the uh, opt-out opportunities for Quebec regarding certain policies, for example, to have an own pension system, to have an own social system, and so on, own healthcare system, but without constitutional special status. So there is no, um, there are some special provisions for Quebec, but what Quebec always wanted through this period of mega constitutional politics was a constitutionally recognized special status. And that's not there. So all three are rather symmetrical. And that is also quite um, typical of mature federal systems that they are, um, on the whole, more symmetrical than um, um, more recently established uh, federal systems. So the last and very important um, um, dichotomy that we have here, and that is really the one where we see a change, is between dual federalism and cooperative federal systems. So dual federalism means that you have as much separation as possible between the different levels of government. So to have really an independent national level and to have independent subnational entities, which of course is never really possible in practice. And cooperate, cooperative federalism of course means that they are integrated to some extent, that they have to cooperate with each other. And here you see that for example Germany uh, has embarked on a journey towards uh, cooperative federalism after 1949 through what I said before, uh, for example, the joint shared tax system. So sh shared taxes were introduced in 1955, as I said before, 1969, through formal amendments of the constitution. There are also joint tasks that the two levels of government in Germany uh, perform. So this, of course, uh, um, um, strengthens the entanglement between the different uh, levels of government so that they are not separated. And also in Canada you have a, sim a similar development. So first, uh, the um, um, Canadian federalism and the different powers um, that, this, that, that the, 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 um, the provinces have and that the national government have um, were seen as watertight compartments. So there should have been really that there was no cooperation envisaged because it was said that it's not, uh, it's not even necessary. Because, let's have a look here at the watertight compartments of the Titanic, how the Titanic worked or not worked. So the idea, you can see down there the watertight compartments. So the idea was to have really neatly separated compartments. And that was the metaphor that, um, uh, that uh, the, 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 in, in, in the case law of Canada was used by the judges to characterize the different powers. So there should be the different provinces having their own powers, exclusive powers, and also the federal government having as well uh, exclusive powers. And there should not be uh, too much interaction uh, between the different levels of government. But then this has changed as well because then the Supreme Court of Canada came to see um, powers um, as being characterized by different aspects. Because, for example, an, uh, a regulation regarding um, environmental matters might fall uh, regarding some aspects into 
the powers of the national government and in other respect, respects regarding other aspects into the powers of um, the provincial governments. So again here you have, have an, a tendency towards more integration. And even in the United States there is a very important and very uh, famous characterization of uh, Canadian federalism, uh, of US federalism, being either layer cake federalism or marble cake federalism. You can see here the layer cake to the left, the marble cake to the right. So the layer cake uh, should mean, of course, that there are different levels of government and they are neatly separated, what I said before. This would be, the layer cake would be dual federalism. And what um, observers of the US Constitution say regarding uh, the development since the New Deal legislation, the, the, the national uh, social policy legislation of Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s, that actually the tendency has gone more into the uh, direction of more integration between the, the different levels of government. They're, they are intermingling the different uh, levels of government so that uh, US federalism uh, now resembles more uh, the image of uh, a marble cake. So I'll, uh, before lunch, I leave you with, uh, with these uh, pictures and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, lecture, which was uh, very rich. And uh, it uh, offered also a possibility to refresh, reconsider certain points certain uh, aspects that we have uh, explored in the unit on uh, constitution making power and uh, the amendment of the constitution. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for questions because we already, uh, are, time is already over. So if you have questions on the topic that were explained today, please uh, uh, take note and tomorrow will be We'll have some time to uh, clarify maybe aspects that were not sufficiently clear or on which you have doubts. Thank you again uh, to uh, Karl Kessler and uh, to you. Uh, we'll see, I'll see you tomorrow uh, at uh, 5. <laughs>